Hello and welcome. You're with us here on Business Today. I'm Abha Bakaya. Here are the headlines tonight. Supreme Court orders review of the capital markets regulatory framework after the Adani stocks fiasco. A six-member committee will submit its report in two months. SEBI asked to widen its probe into the Hindenburg allegations. Markets in the red, even as Adani stocks buck the trend, tech, banks and auto shares drag benchmarks lower, Sensex down 500 points, Nifty down 129 points. Maruti Suzuki prepares for more production pain this month, says semiconductor shortage still hitting operations hard, warns consumers to be ready for a price rise with new pollution norms taking effect from April. It's a big Business Today TV exclusive. The much-anticipated revamp in capital gains tax regime will not be happening anytime soon. Finance Ministry officials say mood and sentiment of the market is not right to take a big step. Tech Wunderkind Elon Musk terms artificial intelligence dangerous, calls for a regulatory authority to keep a check on it, says he's sorry for his role in its development. In a major decision, the Supreme Court has ordered a review of the regulatory mechanism governing the Indian capital market. The Apex Court, in its verdict on the Adani Hindenburg case, appointed a six-member committee. Along with SEBI, the committee will conduct a parallel probe into whether the Adani Group or other companies contravened capital market regulations. For a man who has lost $80 billion this year, the worst is not yet over for Gautam Adani. The billionaire entrepreneur now has not one but two high-level probes into his business affairs and both the probes are monitored by none other than the Supreme Court. The Apex Court passed its judgment after hearing several petitions concerning the loss of investor wealth due to the massive plunge in Adani Group stocks. Total wealth erosion due to sell-off triggered by Hindenburg Research Report has stopped 12 lakh crore rupees last week. In a crucial order, the Supreme Court set up a six-member committee headed by a retired Supreme Court judge. The committee comprises known industry figures like banker K.D. Kamath and technocrat Nandan Nilakani. The committee has been tasked with providing an overall assessment of the situation, including causes and factors which led to volatility in the security market. The panel will also suggest measures to strengthen investor awareness. It will investigate if there has been regulatory failure in dealing with the alleged contravention of laws in relation to Adani Group and other companies. The panel will also suggest measures to strengthen the statutory and regulatory framework. Meanwhile, Capital Markets Regulator SEBI will continue its existing probe into the Adani Hindenburg case. It has, however, been asked to investigate whether there has been a violation of the minimum shareholding laws. SEBI has also been asked by the Supreme Court to look into whether there has been a failure to disclose transactions with related parties in the Adani case. The regulator will look into whether there was any manipulation of stock prices in contravention of existing laws as well. The court has made it clear that its directions will not limit the contours of the ongoing SEBI investigation. Both the committee and SEBI have been asked to submit their report into Adani's affairs to the Supreme Court in two months. Gautam Adani welcomed the probe, tweeting that the order will bring finality in a time-bound manner, adding that the truth will prevail. The markets also welcomed the Supreme Court verdict, sending all 10 Adani Group shares into the green. The flagship Adani Enterprises closed up 2.8%. Five of the 10 stocks hit the upper circuit. The surge in the group stocks added 30,000 crore rupees to the group market cap. The next two months will be crucial as these reports will be filed before the court. After two months, it will be a big question for the Indian markets and the Indian investors as to what really went wrong and what will be done to tighten the system in the country. In New Delhi, with cameraman Ajay Thakur, this is Anisha Mathur for Business Today. 
So who are the six panel members? Business Today TV has these details for you. The committee is headed by Justice A.M. Sapre, who is veteran jurist, having served as the Chief Justice at the Guwahati High Court and the Manipur High Court. The other jurist on the panel is Justice J.B. Devadar, who has been the counsel of uh, the Union of India since 1982. He is an expert in tax laws along with constitutional law and other branches of civil law. K.V. Kamath is a veteran Indian banker who started his career with the ICICI Bank and headed it for a long time. He's held several coveted positions including Chief of the New Development Bank of BRICS Countries, Chairman of Infosys, Independent Director at Reliance Industries and more. O.P. Bhatt is the former Chairman of the State Bank of India and is an Independent Director on the boards of a variety of multinationals including Hindustan Unilever, TCS, Tata Steel and Tata Motors. Nandan Nilakani is the co-founder and chairman of Infosys. He was the founding chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India and held the rank of cabinet minister from 2009 to 2014. Shoma Shekharan Sundaresan, a former journalist, has been a member of several committees set up by the government, SEBI and RBI. He is currently serving on the advisory committee of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India on corporate insolvency and liquidation. So what does the Supreme Court verdict really mean? Does it imply a big change is coming in the regulatory framework? To answer these questions, we're joined by one of the top legal luminaries in India, Ryan Karanjiwala, managing partner of Karanjiwala & Co. Ryan, thanks so much for uh, being with us on the show today. I've Thank been you. looking forward to first getting your reaction to the Supreme Court's uh, uh, statements today and the fact that they've had to come in on this entire issue. I mean, does this imply that uh, somewhere SEBI was lacking in its investigation, that we've had the apex court step in to probe the manipulation of stocks here? So uh, before I uh, begin, let me just make one disclosure, which is that Adani is a client of mine. But nevertheless, now we'll, I'll answer your question straight away. Yeah. Uh, to the question as to whether you felt that the Supreme Court thought that SEBI was lacking in what it was doing, it's a bit of a yes and no uh, uh, answer because they SEBI came to the court and said, "Look, we are investigating into a host of these things. One, okay. two, three, four, five, six. And the Supreme Court has said, "Please continue with the investigation." Mm -hmm. So that investigation has not been stopped. At the same time, the Supreme Court added three other things which they should also investigate into, since they hadn't specifically said they were investigating into it. One was a violation of Rule 19A of the Securities Contract Regulation Act, which is whether the 75% public holding, uh, the 75% uh, private holding uh, regulation has been violated. Whether there has been a failure to disclose transactions with related parties, this is all in the Adani context. And whether there was any manipulation of stock prices in contravention of existing laws. So what the Supreme Court first has done is, it has strengthened and tasked SEBI with looking into far more things. Then it all looking into things which it wanted SEBI to look into in addition to what SEBI was already looking into. That's one. Two, as far as the committee is concerned, the remit of the committee is both micro and macro. While SEBI looks into and reports to the committee and keeps the committee in the loop in what was happening vis-a-vis -vis the Azani group, as far as uh, the committee itself is concerned, they've been asked to give an overall assessment of the situation, including the relevant causal factors, to suggest ways of strengthening investor awareness. So basically, they have been asked to suggest ways to strengthen the institution of stock uh, trading in the country. And they have also been asked to see as to whether in dealing with this, in the there was any regulatory failure insofar as the alleged contravention of laws by the Adani. That's what has happened. Sure. Ryan, to what extent is the Supreme Court also taking note of all the PILs that have come in against the group versus this being a reaction perhaps to the SEBI report? As you just said, it's really expanded the scope. Uh, but what is going to be the due process now? Are we going to wait for the SEBI report so, to come out? Uh, yeah. What's, what happens no, next? The SEBI, the, SEBI, the SEBI will continue. Mm. They will keep the committee in the loop. The committee will look at what SEBI has also said because they'll have to look at some of the findings. Right. See, in, in seeing as to whether there's been a regulatory failure or not, they will have to see what findings SEBI comes to. Because if SEBI comes to say, say yes, there was, this went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong, mm. then the committee in deciding what the regulatory uh, failure was will have to look at everything they've said. 
if SEBI says no, everything was kosher, then again the committee will have to look at uh, what SEBI is saying before they come out with their report. So essentially this is a situation where the Supreme Court has chosen a hand-picked committee which it has great faith in and which I think is an excellent committee and give it, tasked it with the situation of looking at the macro level problems and also seeing as to what Sevi has said as far as the micro level issue is concerned, which is the Adani. And as far as the constitution of the committee is concerned, if I can just venture to say, I don't think they could have found a better committee. And the reason I'm saying it is that this is a situation where everything was being looked at not only within India but also internationally because this is a as you know it came up from the, the whole thing started with the Heidenberg report which is a US based company uh, US based uh, think tank so essentially everyone knew from the beginning that whatever happened in India would also be looked at in the rest of the world now when choosing its committee the Supreme Court has been very very careful they have put on the committee three people with an international reputation Nandan Nilkani, internationally known in India and abroad. Uh, Mr. O.P. Bhatt, former chairman of the State Bank of India, then the chairman of the Indian Banking Association, and on several international company uh, boards, Tata Motors, Tata Steel, TCS, etc. Then you have K.V. Kamath, who not only headed ICICI Bank, but was also in charge of the BRICS Development Bank. So you have people who have international stature mm. and whose word will be accepted not only within India, but also internationally. As far as the judicial members are concerned, you have a judge of the Supreme Court with huge experience. For example, he's been a Justice Sapre, has been a judge of three separate high courts, a chief justice of two other high courts, mm. and in addition to that, has been a judge of the Supreme Court. The, the other judge, Justice J.P. Devdar, is an expert in matters pertaining to SEBI. Uh, Soma Shekharan is a SEBI lawyer and a SEBI expert. Expert again in matters pertaining to SEBI. Mm -hmm. So you have a committee which has high credentials and is very well equipped to deal with the issues at hand and come out with the suggestions for the future. That's how I see it. What, why the entire uh, question around having a sealed envelope around the committee, uh, Ryan? Uh, uh, you know, they, they clearly said that they weren't going to allow a sealed envelope. Uh, it had to be transparent. Uh, did we need to go through that whole process? So that is a question that will sort of, you know, maybe they'll give their report in a sealed envelope. And then it's for the Supreme Court to decide what to do with that sealed envelope. That's, that's, a, that's a question mark for the future. Okay, fair enough. In terms of some of the, you know, ramifications, firstly, of course, we have uh, a reaction from Gautam Adani himself talking about looking forward to a resolution in a time-bound manner. Uh, do you think we will be able to conclude this investigation, have all the inputs and the results, uh, you know, within a couple of months? I mean, what is the expectation when it comes to uh, the kind of time horizon we're looking at here? Well, normally, my experience of committees and commissions are that they do extend. Mm. So I am not in a position, and especially since it hasn't even begun, yeah. I'm not really in a position to see, say as to whether they'll be able to stick to a time-bound manner. But these are individuals of high expertise, yeah. proven track records, high credentials, and also very particular about how they are viewed in the world. Uh, so I see and I believe that there will be a combined effort to come out with a cogent, sensible report as soon as possible. You know, what are the possible ramifications in terms of the threat to, or the risk to the banking system if some of these allegations are found to be true? No, obviously, if a lot of the allegations are found to be true, mm. then it will have an impact. How much of an impact, I don't know, because I have no idea as to the individual strength of each bank and so on. Uh, or how much their exposure is. But, I mean, obviously, uh, if they are overly exposed, then there will be a ramification if the allegations are true. There's no doubt on that. But, again, look at the foresight of the Supreme Court. Mm. Two of the people in the committee are extremely well-known bankers who will be able to pick out and see things in a second. Right, both the courts and the Adani group looking to also assess uh, the Hindenburg uh, research uh, 
uh, report and their role in also possibly causing a complete meltdown in uh, investor wealth when it comes to Adani Group. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us and taking us through uh, you know, your first reactions to the Supreme Court and its uh, statements coming in today. Thank you. Indian equity benchmarks returned to negative territory today. The indices had rebounded yesterday after eight sessions of decline. The indices today were uh, lower on the back of tech, banks, financials and automobile majors. The 30 share BSE Sensex uh, dived over 500 points, closing at 58,909. Nifty moved 120 points lower as well. Broader markets also looking weak. Some of the top movers today, Adani Ports, Coal India, BPCL, Adani Enterprises and Hero Motor Corp. On the list of top laggards, we have auto and IT names like Maruti, Axis Bank, TCS, Tech Mahindra and Infosys. A much anticipated revamp in the capital gains tax regime is unlikely anytime soon. Finance Ministry officials have told Business Today TV that the mood and sentiment of the market was not right to take the step. The last changes in the regime were made in 2019. For more on this, we're joined by BTTV special correspondent Karishma Sudani. Well, yes, it is unlikely that uh, a revamp of the capital gains tax regime could be expected anytime soon. In fact, sources in the finance ministry are telling us that uh, though the discussions have been on, a decision on uh, uh, changing and restructuring of the capital gains tax could actually take longer than thought. It's unexpected uh, uh, in this uh, financial uh, year. In fact, uh, the government is also of the opinion that uh, because of the geopolitical situation, the market sentiments have anyway been dwindling and because of that, uh, um, any kind of further change with the tax structure could not be well taken by taxpayers. Uh, the government is also of the opinion that it is only in 2019 that they had brought the latest change and they'd like to take some more uh, assessment time before uh, they take up a decision of uh, uh, restructuring or revamping the tax regime. The continuing semiconductor shortage is still very much a clear and present danger to the auto industry. That's what the largest automaker in India, Maruti Suzuki, has said to Business Today TV in an exclusive conversation. So much so, the company expects car production to be hit hard this month. Here's an excerpt with my colleagues Sakshi Batra and Shashank Srivastava, Executive Director, Maruti Suzuki. Are you still facing some uh, troubles with the semiconductor shortages and uh, if you could tell us about the production volumes currently? Yes, so there is a, a continued problem as far as the semiconductor uh, component shortages are concerned. We did announce, you know, at the time of quarterly declaration of the quarterly result in Q3 that we lost in Q3 about 46,000 units uh, due to production. We lost uh, some numbers in Jan and in February as well. And in fact, uh, our estimate is in, in March, uh, this uh, loss would be even higher than what we saw in Jan and February. So this quarter as well, we will see a problem regarding the semiconductor and I expect uh, the going forward in the next few quarters, this problem to uh, continue. In fact, uh, you know, uh, 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 we, we have a very low visibility of the future availability. But what about the demand outlook going forward for you for various segments, both the entry level utility vehicles as well going forward? So uh, for the next year, uh, uh, you know, first of all, for the current year, the prediction is that the, the, the we will end up uh, the passenger vehicle sales to be somewhere between 3.85 to 3.9 million units. And uh, on this strong base, uh, the prediction for the growth for the next financial year is between 5 to 7 percent, which means about 4.05 million to 4.1 million. And of course, we have flagged some red, uh, uh, red, red uh, flags which could, you know, impact the demand negatively, which includes, which includes the high interest rates and the uh, loan rates thereof. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, 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 the El Nino, uh, which ca can impact the agricultural incomes, and that can dampen the rural demand, uh, as well as stoke the inflation fears. So how do you expect uh, to uh, be dealing with the prices? Do we expect more hikes from here? Uh, listen, it's possible, but uh, we have not uh, decided uh, yet. We are keenly watching the cost structure, and remember, cost structure for an auto OEM is largely uh, the biggest factor is the material cost. Yes. So it's about 75 to 77 percent of the cost structure for any auto OEM is material cost. And uh, there it depends, uh, much depends on the geopolitical situation. And uh, also remember that from 1st of April, we will have the RD, the new RD norms yes. enforced. 
and that uh, requires a change of specs of the vehicle. For many of our models, we have already done so, uh, and that, is, that implies that there is a cost effect of the change of specs entail some sort of a, a, a cost uh, increase. And uh, we have to see how much of it it can be uh, sort of balanced by the softening in the commodity prices, which we have seen recently. Uh, but uh, we we have to keep uh, you know monitoring the situation and take a decision at an appropriate time. Tata Motors has reported a 3% year-on-year growth in total wholesale units in February. On Wednesday, the company also concluded a 4,000-kilometer Kashmir to Kanyakumari drive in the Nexon EV, which took just under four days. Shailesh Chandra, Managing Director at Tata Motors Passenger Vehicles and Tata Passenger Electric Mobility, spoke exclusively with Business Today TV's Associate Editor Chetan Bhutani. This is immediately after the drive ended in Kanyakumari. Listen in. Well, Mr. Chandra, Tata Motors sales in July, sorry, in January was about 6.4% uh, up at 81,069 units. With El Nino fears coming up, do you think uh, the rural sales would be impacted uh, with the fears? You know, as I said, that uh, electrification is a very uh, new category and uh, participation of competition and more players in this space is only going to expand the market. So I think, you know, there can be a slight. Uh, you know, change in uh, the sales numbers, you know, for a few months. But uh, eventually, this market is only going to grow for all of us. So right. this is this is a new category. It is going to grow. Uh, and therefore, uh, all the players who are going to participate in this are going to see growth year after year. Right. Uh, Mr. Chandra, uh, earlier Blue Smart and of course now Uber for the supply of about 25,000 EVs. Uh, is Tata Motors in, in, in literally in race to acquire all major big, deal, big deals from uh, major uh, ride dealing companies? We are in discussion with uh, many fleet operators, you know, for different usages. Some of them will be for ride hailing purpose. Some of them are being used for corporate fleet usage for employee transport. So we are in discussion with, you know, more than 50 of such companies and we always already had a very strong relationship for the last four five years so we are working with all these fleet operators uh, and basis they plan for electrification we are helping them uh, you know go towards electric uh, in a very smooth manner so that's our attempt uber is the latest addition uh, in uh, in the relationship that we have with uh, various fleet operators Right, Mr. Chandra, also could you give us a sense of for the waiting time of vehicles for important Tata Motor vehicles and supply chain issues if they are really persisting or are we completely over the supply chain issues and the semiconductor shortages? You know, broadly I would say that uh, for uh, majority of the parts we are, uh, uh, we are pretty much secure as far as semiconductor supplies are concerned. You know, there are one or two components where uh, we are getting impacted, you know, even and often. But uh, if you just ask me a broad sense of where things are, it seems to be under much greater control than where we were, say, a year back. So you had earlier mentioned when we met at the Auto Expo of a, a possible price hike or probably two, uh, two possible price hikes and the first has been implemented from the 1st of February. Now that the supply chain issues are sorted, uh, are you looking at uh, the second price hike also or can it be deferred? No, so I would not like to comment at this stage, you know, we have already taken a recent price uh, hike across the range of our cars and uh, we will review this uh, in the first quarter of next financial year. Right, so emission norms for the April 1st are coming up. Uh, is the company ready and uh, do you think uh, the customer will have to pay a more premium uh, for uh, the BS2, uh, BS6 Part 2 norms? You know, as of Feb, we have completely transitioned to BS6 Phase 2 as far as passenger cars are concerned. Uh, so we have already made that transition. Uh, definitely a part of this increase is already reflecting in the price increase that we have taken in Feb. Uh, and uh, there will be a part which will be taken in the subsequent price increase. And that's where we leave it on the show tonight. Thanks so much for watching.